um, LHH Knightsbridge, Best Life Rewarded, Green Shield Canada, and PWC. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> now, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to our incredible volunteers who helped us so very much this morning. So thank you. I think there's about six of them in the room today. So thank you so very much. Now, the Economic Club is this country's national podium of record. Annually, we host close to 100 events right across the country. And our goal is to bring Canadians together to talk about the most important issues of the day. At the Economic Club, we've ded dedicated ourselves to involving young Canadians in conversations. And I know that today's featured speaker and his government are committed to the same goal and cause. Minister, we thank you for your interest in supporting youth throughout the country and for the initiatives that you've been taking um, to support youth. Now, young Canadians joining us today, yes, like everyone keeps telling you, you are the leaders of today, but you're also the leaders of tomorrow. And we absolutely are delighted to have you in the room, and thank you very, very much for being here. Now, today the Minister will deliver a keynote speech, followed by a moderated discussion with Ms. Lorraine Mitchell-Moore, former Country Chair of Shell Canada, Chair of the Federal Economic Strategy Table's Resources of the Future, Board of Suncor Canada, and Board of BMO. We are delighted to have you here today, Lorraine. Thank you very much. Now, to officially get things started, it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to President and CEO of Parkland, Mr. Bob Espy. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here today. I would like to take the opportunity to thank the Minister for coming to Calgary and congratulate him on the Trans Mountain Expansion Project approval, as well as the recent dismissals of the Supreme Court and Federal Court of Appeal challenges. The issues facing our country, our province, and our businesses are becoming much more complex. Today, there is a need for all of us to think more broadly about where our businesses fit, to get, fit into the larger issues that are influencing our commu communities, the country, and the world. The Economic Club of Canada has long been a place for these types of broader discussions. These events promote dialogue and debate, both from the speakers, but also among those of us in the audience. As a result, these events contribute to better understanding and to developing a path forward in what can be challenging times. One of these challenges is the ongoing effort to enhance alignment and understanding between policymakers and business leaders. It is fair to say that nowhere is that challenge more urgent than here in Alberta. Here we see most clearly the importance of balancing the world's growing needs for energy with highly innovative technical achievements that lower our collective environmental impact while at the same time support the continued ec economic su success of one of Canada's most important regions and one of our most important industries. The transition to a lower carbon future must be taken thoughtfully. Parkland is proud to be the partner of choice for our customers providing safe, innovative and reliable energy solutions for today. But we are also focused on looking at the types of investment we can make to shape our low carbon future, while still ensuring we are there for our customers, our employees, and our many stakeholders. We are having that discussion at the board table with our executive leadership, our shareholders, and with our employees. But we need help. Companies like ours need to work in partnership with government to make the significant low carbon capital investments needed to meet the government's environmental goals and make Canada a leader in the low carbon fuel space. And that is why I'm so pleased that Minister Morneau has come to town to share his perspective with us. I'm sure the Minister needs no introduction to most of you in the room, but I will remind you that he's been Finance Minister since the government was first elected in 2015. He has played a key role in the Trans Mountain Pipeline Expansion Project and has shown a real commitment to listening to the priorities and concerns of Alberta businesses. The Minister has rec was recently here listening to the concerns of Alberta's business leaders at a roundtable hosted by the Business Council of Alberta. We appreciate him taking time to be here to continue the dialogue on Canada's economic future. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Minister Morneau to Calgary.
Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Bob, for that uh, very nice introduction. And uh, I think I'd start by thanking Parkland and TC Energy and, of course, the Economic Club of Canada for sponsoring this morning. I'd also like to thank all of you for being here Monday morning at 7.30 in the morning, which shows a, uh, a level of commitment that, uh, that is uh, pretty significant, both for what, uh, what I'm talking about, but I'm sure all of you are here because you're thinking about the the economic future of Alberta and Canada. I think, as all of you know, I'm here uh, to talk primarily about uh, Trans Mountain and the Trans Mountain pipeline expansion. But I thought I'd start by providing some context, <clears throat> because I know that, like those of us who are thinking about our, our direction uh, as a country, many of you here are thinking about uh, global issues that are impacting you personally and impacting our economy. We saw not that long ago, obviously, tensions in the Middle East that led to the downing of uh, Flight 752, a, a tragic occurrence that uh, impacted 138 people with direct ties to Canada, either citizens or permanent residents. We also saw that 30 of those people were Albertans, you know, family members, friends, colleagues, all lost. We also now are looking at a, uh, an enormous uh, challenge in China with the coronavirus. I know it has uh, all of us paying very close attention. Certainly we are uh, paying very close attention in Ottawa. What I can tell you is that the health risk <clears throat> remains low and that the health authorities in British Columbia and Ontario and in Ottawa and people here in Alberta are working together well to make sure we have protocols in place. I think we always need to recognize those people who are doing a good job for our country and for our health. But I, I do want to acknowledge that the virus is undoubtedly going to have an economic impact. I'm also sure that it will be a central topic of the meetings that I'm going to next week. Next week I'm going to the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meetings in uh, Riyadh where we'll be talking about the global economy and the challenges. Certainly one of the things that we will be focused on will be the overall state of our economy globally. One of the most important issues we'll be talking about will be trade and the rising impact of protectionism, which we're seeing around the world. I want to tell you that from our perspective, we will be advocating for rules-based trade. Canada is a trading nation. We're the only G7 country with trade agreements with all other G7 countries. And we know that advocating for rules-based trading is critically important for businesses. For businesses to invest and create jobs, they need to have confidence in the system. You can't take a leap of faith if you don't have faith in the rules that you're taking that leap in and around. The new NAFTA is making its way through Parliament, and uh, we're confident that it will be uh, approved. I want to just call out uh, Premier Kenny and other Premiers who were in Washington last week advocating for the fast approval of this. Any of you talking to your members of Parliament, it would be very helpful if you reinforced the importance of moving forward on this rapidly for the uh, confidence of our economy and for our business sector. I'll also be talking to international partners about the importance of having rules that work for everyone. We're focused on making sure that international tech giants play by the same tax rules as other companies. We don't want to give an advantage to international companies that isn't the same advantage for Canadian companies. And we're going to continue to push in that regard. But as I said, I'm sure that coronavirus will be an area of focus. Uh, we can't know what the economic impacts are right now. Bloomberg came out recently with an estimate that it would impact the global economy by about 0.4% in 2020. And thinking about 0.4%, we need to keep that in the context of an economy globally that's growing at around 3%. So it's a significant impact. We also know that the impacts on Canada will be real. Impacts on tourism, impacts on the oil sector, and of course impacts on supply chain for any business that has a supply chain that is integrated with the Chinese producers or, uh, or Chinese consumers even from that standpoint. Oil fight prices have fallen by about 15% uh, during this, uh, this crisis uh, as a result of reduced uh, demand and of course we have many, many fewer flights going in and out of, of China. 
So we know the impact is real. It's going to be felt uh, across the country, but perhaps even more so here in, uh, in the oil and gas sector. So in that context, it's important that we consider the state of the uh, Canadian economy to provide uh, information on how we're going to do. Right now, the Canadian economy remains strong. As we do our, our budget projections, we go out to private sector economists, and 14 out of 14 economists that we survey have projected growth for our economy in 2020. As I think you know, we've seen significant job growth across the country since 2015, with about 1.1 million jobs having been created during that time period. And overall, our economy is in a strong position. Our debt, as a function of our GNP, is, a, uh, is in a very positive situation. We have the lowest level of debt as a function of our economy among G7 countries. It really is the envy of other countries. We're projected to be the second fastest growing economy in the G7 this year. But I will tell you that globally, uh, volatility remains the key risk. And obviously that's been illustrated vividly over the past couple of months. So we know that we need to be financially responsible as we ensure that we have the capability and the resiliency to deal with any challenges that come our way, challenges that we might not be able to see right now. It's important that we're prepared for this, and I can tell you that this will be an important guide for us in this mandate of the government. I suspect that there's no place in Canada where the uh, need to understand being prepared for all eventualities is more obvious than here in Calgary. Albertans have had a, a difficult time over the last number of years as a result of the decline in global energy and commodity prices. I know that I'm telling that to a room full of people who've actually experienced those challenges. We know that across the province, workers are worried. They're wondering, in many cases, when they'll get their job back. And I, I recognize that as Minister of Finance, it's my responsibility to think about economic opportunities for all Canadians, including people in this province and in Western Canada that are going through challenges. When the Prime Minister and Premier Kenny met recently, they committed to working together on behalf of the people of Alberta, something that no doubt all of you would just expect should be the way it works. And with the challenges facing Western Canada, it's important that we think about ways that we can strengthen Alberta's economy and support workers. And that brings me to the context of Trans Mountain. We've obviously made a key investment in the Trans Mountain Corporation and its expansion. When uh, a Texas business wanted to step away we stepped in to support this important project to show faith in our Western Canadian economy and to recognize the importance of our uh, ability to get our resources to market. As you know, with almost all of our energy exports going to the United States, our price, the price that we get, is undervalued. And we deserve in Canada to get a fair price for our resources. At a time when the Alberta and Saskatchewan economies are struggling because of low commodity prices, it's important that we make the necessary investments to open up those uh, opportunities internationally. And that is why we're investing in the Trans Mountain Corporation and the expansion. In August, construction on the project got underway. There are nearly 3,000 workers on the project right now, and at peak construction, we expect to have about 5,500 people working on this in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Alberta and BC primarily, but Saskatchewan also in terms of the work that's going on uh, in, in that province to build some of the pipe. Construction on both Spread 1 in the Greater Edmonton region and Spread 2 in Yellowknife is underway with about 50 kilometers of pipe already having been laid in and around the Edmonton area. Contractors have started work on the Burnaby Terminal, the Westridge Marine Terminal, the Edmonton Terminal, and pumping stations here in Alberta. The project's creating good, well-paying jobs across Western Canada, in construction, in engineering, in finance, and in monitoring. So these are important jobs that are creating opportunities for people in places where there are significant challenges. As you know, last week, the Board of Directors of Trans Mountain Corporation released their new estimate of construction costs between $12.6 billion and $13.2 billion, which includes contingencies and reserves. The board also affirmed that this project remains strong and commercially viable 
and that Canada's investment in Trans Mountain remains on course to generate a positive financial return. The project includes 15 to 20 year contractual commitments from shippers. Their contractual commitments provide long term revenue certainty and underpin the commercial viability of the project. And while we recognize that this number is higher than previous estimates, we need to reflect on what's changed since this costing was originally put forward by Kinder Morgan back in 2017. Today's project, as I think you know, has gone, gone through extensive consultations with Indigenous peoples. It's supporting union jobs in Alberta and British Columbia. It's providing training and building opportunities. And it's been, been designed to a higher standard of environmental protections. It's going to be using thicker steel than originally estimated and advanced monitoring systems. So we know that these state-of-the-art approaches will enhance the protection of our environment and our communities. We also know that now this project is even better than it was when we took it on. We believe that this new estimate is realistic and we remain confident that when it's the appropriate time to sell, we will see a profit on this investment. The project will triple the capacity of the current pipeline system. The new pipeline will twin the existing uh, 1,147 kilometers going from Edmonton to Burnaby with about 987 kilometers of new buried pipeline. And it's important to consider the history. The original pipeline has been in operation since 1953. Obviously, the uh, demand for Canadian resources has gone up significantly by then, since then. And producers are resorting, as all of you know, to sending resources by rail. Last week, we had an, an important reminder of the vulnerability of that approach. When I was speaking about this project to Donna Harper, she's the Saskatchewan Minister of Finance, she told me that her family, which lives around the Guernsey, Saskatchewan area, last week was evacuated because of the smoke from the derailment that went on there. And that's just after about one and a half million litres of oil were spilled back in December uh, as well. So luckily in both these incidents, no one was hurt. But it reminds us of the advantage of sending oil by pipeline. Just to be clear, we all know that pipelines are the most economically responsible, environmentally sound, and safe mode of transportation. And by increasing the capacity of the pipeline, we'll ensure that more oil gets moved in the best way possible. While we know there's been significant challenges along the way, the economic benefit of this project is going to be profound, and that includes benefits for Indigenous communities. The project's providing employment and training opportunities for Indigenous peoples as well as significant contracting with Indigenous-led businesses. On top of that, as you may know, Trans Mountain has signed now 58 benefit agreements with Indigenous communities worth more than $500 million. And when complete, the project will generate over a billion dollars worth of Indigenous-based contract awards. The Conference Board of Canada estimates that over the course of construction in the first 20 years of operation, this project will generate about $160 billion for the Canadian economy, of which about $46 billion will go to uh, government. Of that, of that $46 billion, uh, approaching half, $19.4 billion, is estimated to go to Alberta, supporting the province and municipalities in Alberta for things and services that Albertans need going forward. So we, we also know, though, that this project will help support us in the reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. Last week, the Federal Court of Appeal, as Bob mentioned, rendered its decision in cold water versus Canada. The case arose, as you may know, I certainly remember, after the 2018 appeal ruling, appeal court ruling, that found that the National Energy Board hadn't properly executed its duty to consult with Indigenous peoples. So we undertook renewed Crown consultations. We uh, responded when Indigenous groups asked for more time. We allowed more time. We wanted to make sure that we did this in the right way. A lengthy report on the consultations was submitted to Cabinet, and we amended con conditions in our subsequent review and project approval. So in the decision last week, the Court found that through our re-review process that the Federal Government had and I quote, remedied its flaws in consultation. 
and that the federal government had engaged in, and again I quote, meaningful consultation with Indigenous peoples. So this decision gives the project the certainty that it needs. And with it moving forward, we will continue to engage with Indigenous peoples potentially impacted to find ways that they can have a direct economic stake in the project. So today I want to announce that we will be launching the next step of this engagement with interested Indigenous groups. This next step will be focused on different models of economic participation, such as equity-based or revenue sharing options, and we'll seek to build mo momentum towards a widely acceptable option for the groups that we're consulting with. It will also explore whether the participating communities are prepared to work together, either through an existing entity or a new one. We'll be reaching out to the 129 uh, potentially impacted indigenous groups in the coming weeks and months. We will ensure that Indigenous communities have an opportunity for meaningful economic participation while managing our investment in a way that benefits all Canadians and allows the project to continue to operate on a commercial basis. Even though it will operate on a commercial basis, we will be using the revenues, Canada will be using the revenues that we get from this project, from additional corporate taxes estimated at about $500 million a year and from the sale to fund Canada's transition to a cleaner economy. Every dollar that the federal government earns from the project will be invested in nature-based climate solutions and the clean energy projects that will power our homes and our businesses and our communities for the future. Alberta's energy sector has been about continual innovation since day one, and I want to say that it's more important than ever in today's context that this innovation continues to go forward. We know that Alberta has some great clean energy projects in the works. Suncor has proposed a 40-mile wind power project, which actually is a 50,000-acre proposal. TransAlta has stated its vision to be a leader in the clean energy sector, clean power company by 2025, which includes growth in renewable energy, like wind and solar, while reducing coal emissions. But it's also good to see oil and gas companies investing in innovations to reduce their carbon footprint right now. According to a recent Bank of Montreal study, producers on average have cut their carbon intensity by 22% since 2012. And I know that CNRL has reduced its own carbon intensity by about uh, 28%, 29% since 2012, and their methane emissions by 78%. So we're seeing that across Alberta, Companies are finding ways to reduce emissions, improve energy efficiency, and to innovate. Suncor has publicly supported putting a price on pollution, recognizing that it's a tool that, and I quote, can accelerate emission performance improvements. So one of the important commitments that we made in the election campaign was to cut tax rates by 50% for companies that develop and manufacture zero emissions technologies in Canada. That includes carbon sequestration and removal technology, which I know Alberta firms are also looking into. I will say that Canada remains committed to meeting our Paris target, and as we transition to a low-carbon economy, the innovations and expertise of the Alberta energy sector are going to be mission critical. And as the global economy looks for cleaner ways of doing things, every solution that we come up with right here at home will help us to compete and win in a challenging playing field. Our plan since 2015 has been about investing in Canadians, investing in the people who work hard to build up our economy. Trans Mountain and the pipeline expansion and the workers who help to develop the resources that the world still relies on are an important part of that plan. We're also investing in programs that make it easier for people to afford higher education, help workers retrain and to help families create and get more affordable childcare. The first thing we did uh, after our most recent election was to bring forward a tax plan that would reduce taxes for about 20 million Canadians. It's what we're going to do is we're going to raise the basic personal amount so that the first $15,000 of uh, income people don't pay taxes on between here and 2023. We want to build on the progress of the last four years in a way that's responsible and makes a real and measurable difference in the lives of Canadians and it also sets us up for the future. That includes moving forward with our plan to reduce emissions, 
and to grow our economy. And that's why I'm so pleased to be here today, to reiterate our commitment to move forward expeditiously on the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. It'll allow Canada to support workers today to make real investments in our transition to a greener economy and build the clean economy of tomorrow. So thank you for being here this morning, and I'm looking forward to talking with Lorraine. Thank you very much. The one thing that uh, Bob didn't mention that was that Lorraine was also on the uh, Trans Mountain Board until recently, so uh, she has some additional expertise beyond the things that he, uh, he mentioned. Don't ask me any questions on Trans Mountain. <laughs> well, I won't ask you any questions that you <laughs> can't answer, you. as long as you don't ask me any questions exactly. that I can't answer. We've got, I'm just shaking. Yeah, we should. We've got a deal on that. Okay. We've got a deal. <laughs> so we're going to speak about our families and our yeah, vacation plans. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm sure everybody's interested in that. Uh, First of all, I want to say thanks. I, I think you, uh, since you've been minister uh, in the last four or five years, you've spent a lot of time in getting to know Alberta and uh, getting to know people in Calgary and our industry, which is, I just want to say on behalf of everybody here, I think it's really appreciated. And you can tell that from uh, what you know now about the industry. And of course, having been on the board of Trans Mountain, I can tell everybody in this room how committed this government was to making this happen and I really appreciated the time that I spent there. Uh, so just a few questions. I'll, and first, of course, Trans Mountain is uh, the topic of the day in uh, Calgary, and uh, we're all pretty excited about uh, the decision ca that came down last week. Um, it seems like we're starting to finally go in the right direction. So how do you see this decision by the uh, Federal Court of Appeal impacting future infrastructure development? And does this ruling, which we hope, actually provide more certainty for investors going forward? How does it pave the way for us going forward? Well, I, I mean, I think after the decision last week, that's the question on people's minds, reasonably. Um, in the first instance, I would just identify what, we, what actually happened last week. I mean, we, we were told, and I remember the day on our August 30th, uh, 2018, that, uh, that the consultations that had taken place before did not meaningfully address the issues with Indigenous peoples. We also were told that we needed to deal with the southern resident killer whale situation off the coast of BC. We were given a specific roadmap to how we could move forward. I think what it tells us last week is that if you, if you follow through on delivering exactly what is expected, and we did, we followed through on moving forward to deal with the issues around the coast of British Columbia, and we followed through in ensuring safety there, and we followed through to make sure that we had meaningful consultation with Indigenous peoples, and that meant not just listening, but listening, considering alternatives, uh, looking for uh, opportunities to uh, deal with the issues that were presented in a way that was constructive, that you actually can get approval. So on this project, I think we were given a roadmap of, of how to do things. It's, uh, it is obviously never going to be easy in terms of doing projects that go across a uh, significant uh, geographical uh, expanse. Uh, that's the reality of, of projects here and, and around the world. I, I don't know that I would, I would say that this uh, completely deals with, with investors uh, challenges because as I travel around the world, I hear from institutional investors that what they're encouraged by is, is a greater level of project certainty, but what they are continually concerned with is the sustainability of each business that they invest in. So, so what I'm hearing from inter institutional investors is they want to ensure that the businesses that they invest in are sustainable for the long term, that they have an approach to dealing with the carbon intensity of their business, that allows them to move in a, uh, in a direction that gives them confidence that they'll be part of a, a, a lower carbon future. And I think we, we're all engaged in that, uh, in that exercise. And very specifically, those of you who are, are in companies looking at this issue are personally engaged in how we can move forward in a way that provides greater investor certainty for the future. Yeah, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, of course, having that approval for TMX is quite exciting, but we've had the approvals before, and now it's gone all the way uh, to the federal court. Um, but of course, we're, every night on the news, we're watching what's happening to uh, the coastal gas link uh, project. And so 
the construction is in, on the go with uh, Trans Mountain. What is the government prepared to do when we see the same thing happening on uh, TMX as what's happening on Coastal Best Link right now uh, to actually face similar obstacles? Well, I think it's important to look at what's going on with that project. It's a project that is, has been approved. It's a, uh, a legal project, and uh, law enforcement officials are uh, working to ensure that the legality of the project can be uh, continued. Uh, my sense is that they're doing a good job. Uh, we expect that for any project that's uh, abiding by the laws in Canada that we should uh, have that similar approach. Uh, we have a great deal of confidence in uh, those officials and the work that they're doing. Uh, we also know that we live in a country where people are uh, allowed to express their point of view. So within the constraints of the law, people uh, will express their points of view and it will be up to uh, law enforcement officials to make sure that's done in an, in an orderly way and that we can move forward. Uh, that's our ongoing expectation. Uh, now that we've gone through those approval processes that that will be able to uh, move forward in that way. Yeah, I think it's been a step-by-step -step, uh, ladder here of getting to uh, this position. And then uh, it was great to hear you announce this morning that we're continuing to work with Indigenous people. So how important is it that Indigenous people become a, part, a partner in this TMX project and, uh, and, and move that towards reconciliation? I, I think the Indigenous people uh, challenge that we have in Canada is the linchpin to our success in the future. And so beyond ownership, if we can get that towards reconciliation, what other tools do we have to actually uh, have Indigenous people be a part of our future resource development? unlike it was in the past? Well, we see this as, as critically important. <clears throat> we obviously, on a different track, the government is very focused on the indigenous reconciliation. We are working with people so that we can get First Nations to have the capacity to run, uh, to run their First Nation on their own. That's an important track. We're working on the delivery of, of services to indigenous peoples that uh, ensures that they have the kind of opportunities that all of us expect. Uh, on projects, we, uh, we don't think there's a path for us to move forward on projects that are impacting uh, Indigenous peoples without some sort of uh, extensive dialogue and uh, approach to ensure that there's engagement. We have seen really rigorous um, work over the course of the last couple of years with Trans Mountain. As I mentioned uh, in my uh, remarks, We've gone from 43 benefit agreements to 58 benefit agreements over the last couple of years since we've been engaged. This is really important. We also have the overwhelming majority of Indigenous peoples impacted along the route in support of this project. That said, I think as we talk with, with the, uh, the people impacted along the route, they want to be engaged for the long term. There's a very real concern that from 1953 until now, They've not been engaged in the economic advantage that's come from these, uh, this pipeline. So we are uh, committed to having some sort of long-term economic participation that makes sense. Uh, there are people here in this room who've spent a lot of time on this. There's good models in other projects where there's been economic participation. We hope that we will create a, a very good uh, framework that others can consider down the road as well. And that means that the next step in our process has to has to think about how we find a way to get to an answer that has a large amount of consensus. I mean, the challenge will be that with such a large group, it's often difficult to get everyone to agree on, on the right approach moving forward. But in the next step phase, what we're trying to do is ensure that we have the financial and legal and business uh, expertise from a broad uh, number of the indigenous peoples impacted so they can all be engaged and we can find a, a common approach to uh, some form of investment that will ensure that there's uh, economic advantage going forward. I think that will uh, be a very, very positive way for us to show that uh, these sort of projects, which are good for our economy, which can be responsible environmentally, can also uh, positively impact the people that we're trying to reconcile with uh, for the future. So what other kinds of uh, opportunities are there for Indigenous people? Like one of the challenges that I see is Indigenous people in, we always say is employment for Indigenous people. But what I'd love to see eventually is a lot more business opportunities where uh, businesses that uh, we have in Indigenous communities actually go beyond the pipeline, actually become global businesses. What kind of programs have the government put in place 
to actually get more science training, management training, et cetera, and business training and leadership so that we can have them be a full participation in Canada's economy, and in particular in the resource development. Well, I, I think we should separate the Trans Mountain Project from, from the broader efforts. On the Trans Mountain Project, it's the company. The company is an independent, it's run on a commercial basis, yeah. and they've made significant uh, attempts not only to have benefit agreements, but also to have uh, Indigenous-led businesses yeah. be part of the project. And I mentioned the scale of that, which is very significant. So that, that is very helpful, because obviously getting those businesses uh, an opportunity is, is important. On, on the broader front, I mean, why we think that Indigenous economic participation is important is it provides the kind of uh, opportunities for economic advantage that can be put back into, into communities, and that, that we see as, as critical. In many of the Indigenous peoples that are along the route, there are not significant uh, opportunities for businesses. So we see this as a, as a really good way to help those, uh, those communities become more successful. And then specifically, our efforts have to be in, in all of the, if you think about what Indigenous Services Canada is doing, we're trying to deliver on all of the issues that get people to the stage where they can be there. So we have to start with the very basics. We, we need the kind of infrastructure on reserve that, that people should just expect. I mean, we've made big progress on uh, boiled water advisories, but there's still more work to be done. We've made big progress on infrastructure, but you know, contemplate how difficult it is to make projects uh, work with infrastructure on places where changing permafrost means that the infrastructure doesn't necessarily always stay in place over a period of time. So there are, there are very real uh, challenges that we're dealing with. We need to deal with those things, putting more money into educational opportunities, uh, K-12, to and trying to find ideas like scholarship opportunities so people can go to the next step. Uh, but I think you're right. We also need to think about how we create opportunities for Indigenous-led businesses, which projects like this can do, and other projects. I mean, we're not, uh, it's not unique to the Trans Mountain Project. You know, I was encouraged when I saw that TC Energy in their project recently on, uh, put forward the idea of having a 10% set aside for uh, Indigenous peoples, which, which is going to create opportunity there as well. And, and so there's a model that's being built that will support uh, businesses, that will support people to create opportunity that can hopefully be put back into the community and create uh, what I hope is a virtuous circle. Excellent. Uh, let me switch gears a, bit, a little bit uh, to competitiveness, which is our favorite word here. And um, so we talk a lot about market access. That's all we've been talking about, actually, for the last decades, uh, certainly in my vernacular, and uh, for energy. Uh, but as you said in your speech, Canada is a trading nation. So market access goes across all uh, different sectors. And, and agriculture is a huge opportunity for Canada and for Alberta as well. And, uh, but over the last uh, decade, and uh, particularly in the last year, we've, our share of market share of global uh, exports for agriculture has fallen from 4.9% to 3.9% last year. And uh, a large part of that is because of lack of infrastructure. So we got an infrastructure issue right across the board. And it speaks to two issues. One is the commitment to infrastructure, but the second is certainly international or interprovincial trade barriers, which seems to be our own uh, problem that we've created here in Canada. And I'm sure you agree to that. But also, how do we encourage this cooperation from coast to coast for the greater good of the country? And uh, how can the government move to have more infrastructure in place to grow our export markets, not just in agriculture, but right across? And one of the things that we were excited about was the infrastructure bank, which I knew, uh, know you led. And so what I'm wondering is how does this infrastructure bank actually facilitate a long-term strategic uh, plan for infrastructure across not just agriculture, but across all sectors? Wow, so let me unpack that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there were a few questions embedded in there, I think. So, so first of all, I think we need to start by recognizing how important our agricultural sector is. Um, I'm not, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but the percent is important, but it's also a question of how the scale of our business is, because there's increasingly more arable land in parts of the world that didn't have arable land before uh, because of climate change. So, so I don't know whether that reflects an actual decline or whether that just reflects a percentage share. I think that's important. But I think if, you're, if the, the premise of it was that we have a challenge of infrastructure in getting our goods to market, 
then uh, you know today's discussion is critically important. I mean, we see that the uh, the resource sector is sending more and more of its resources by rail and. What I can tell you in my office, what happens is that we get complaints from the agricultural sector that doesn't have access to that rail because the, uh, the uh, space is being used up by the, uh, the resource sector. So, so as we create, you know, go from the capacity that we currently have in the, in the pipeline to a bigger capacity, of course, that will free up rail capacity for the agricultural sector. So these things are very related. Um, I think as we think about the, the next part of what you were asking about around interprovincial trade, you know, it's, I think it's important to give uh, the Alberta Premier, Premier Kenny, a shout out for trying to make a unilateral approach that's going to make a difference in interprovincial trade. You know, last, uh, last uh, government, I spent some time as the interprovincial trade minister as well because one of my colleagues was, was sick, Dominic LeBlanc. And when going to those meetings, what you realize is, I mean, every province has its own uh, issues around specific things. And the, the, the issues around interprovincial trade, I mean, transportation is really big. I mean, provinces need to decide to get to a common uh, understanding of how goods can be transported across the country. I mean, we have different regulations for trucks in different parts of the country, which makes no sense. Imagine if you're a trucking company and you have to change your cabs when you go across one, one province to another. I mean, it makes no sense. But it's, it's really at the provincial level that this needs to be dealt with. And it's because of individual lobbies that, that we all need to get a handle on. Um, so that, that's really important. And the final issue is, you know, how are we going to do it? How, what, is there an enabling function that the federal government can have? And that was the issue behind the Canada Infrastructure Bank. To remind you what that was, we said we want to put in place a bank that's going to uh, be able to invest in what we call bankable projects that would drag institutional investment in as well. So it would be projects where there's a revenue model so that you know, the Japanese pension fund might want to invest alongside the Canada Infrastructure Bank and the Canada Pension Plan, for example. So we see huge opportunities in the transportation sector, in the, uh, in the infrastructure sector more broadly, because there's many projects, you know, the, the pipeline would be a good one, that are, that are very bankable projects. The question is when the infrastructure bank should jump in. And the idea is that it, it will jump in in projects where it might give the edge for that project to move forward because they have some capital they can put in place at a lower rate of return than, a, than another institution might be able to, which, which makes the project work. So, um, you know, thinking about things like the electrification of the, the grid here in Alberta, which would be an important way for us to drive down our, our carbon emissions, that's the sort of project that might be something that the infrastructure bank could work on. Uh, working on, you know, high speed High-speed rail is obviously something where getting it off the ground is sometimes challenging, but the economics are probably positive, and the impact on our on our environment is positive. So those are those are some of the things, and and you know they're they're intending to go through each one of these projects, and they're making progress against projects that that will be able to be delivered. So that's so the infrastructure bank is coming in more at the tactical level, looking at a project by project basis, but who is looking at the long term? Because one of the recommendations we, that came from our strategy tables was to look at a long-term strategic infrastructure plan for the country because, as you said, we're a trading nation and infrastructure is absolutely critical. It's the boring part, but it's actually the foundation of the economy. Who, who's, how are we thinking about that long-term strategic plan? Sorry, just to well, it's elaborate. an important question. I think the, the, uh, the way we put in place our infrastructure plan over 11 years was focusing on some of that on trade and transportation corridors. Uh, the, uh, the reality is, though, we need to work together with provinces. So, so really nothing gets delivered in Canada on that, at that level if provinces don't agree with the federal government. So it, it becomes essential that the, uh, the key projects are identified by the province in collaboration with the federal government so we can move forward. A couple more questions. Um, infrastructure is very important, but regulations is equally important uh, for, uh, to build a competitive economy. And uh, one of the biggest challenges that we've had is regulations. I mean, that's why the government has had to buy uh, the TMX. And uh, it really stems from just what you just talked about. We've got over, uh, overlapping jurisdictions, a uh, very complicated regulatory system. And just to give everybody in the room, and I think you know this statistic, this statistic that I can't say the word, uh, Canada ranks 34 out of 35 OECD countries when it comes to a timely issuance of a construction permit. 
And the number two in that 35 is our nearest neighbor, the US. So that's our uh, real competitor. So we have to change that. And so the challenge is we have top quartile regulatory in environmental, but bottom quartile in efficiency. So how do we, and, and you talked about companies uh, or investors wanting much more sustainability built in, which is really important, and I think it is a competitive advantage for Canada. How do we make actually regulatory excellence Canada's competitive advantage? I, you know, I, I think you've pointed out one of the big challenges because it's going to be at different levels of the government that we need to focus. Construction permits is clearly one that is uh, typically municipal with an overlay of provincial. Our idea around the infrastructure bank is if we actually identify a project that makes sense and we get funding for it, then that funding will force people to say, oh, we need to move forward on these permits because we have funding for a project. So, so there's a way the federal government can come in and say, look, there's, this project is ready to go forward, so move forward on, on the permits. Uh, but I do think there's a real challenge with different levels of government being engaged in these things. I don't really, as I think about what was the impediment on Trans Mountain, I really think it was more of a political impediment between British Columbia and Alberta, reflecting the different points of view on the environment and the economy, uh, as well as a concern around how we get through the consultation process with uh, you know, 129 different groups. So I see it as somewhat different than the, the actual regulatory frame, but more you know, real political challenges, which is why I think the federal government had an important role to play in reconciling those, those issues. Uh, moving forward, what I would ask businesses is, rather than saying our regulatory system doesn't work, identify what the regulatory issues are for your business at a granular level so that we can actually get at them. When we hear about regulatory problems, what that's normally code for is uh, regulation around the oil and gas sector and uh, the agricultural slash pharmaceutical sector. Those are kind of the two federal government uh, sectors. So, so we kind of need to know what are the specific issues that people think we need to deal with. And if it's, if it's rolling back whole scale legislation that was put in place to try and create more certainty, and granted, there's always going to be discord around new legislation, and that's probably not a productive way to go at it. It's more, what are the specific things that we can change that will make a difference for my business uh, in the case of, of people in this room and across the country? And we need to get at that. But we also have a very real responsibility to protect Canadians. So when when the agricultural sector or the, the, uh, the, the food sector says, you know, we don't like labeling on, on our food goods, our response is we need to listen, but we also need to make sure people have appropriate labeling so they can feel safe and, and make good choices. So, so there's always going to be a, a two points of, of view that we need to reconcile. So innovation is absolutely critical uh, in the future uh, for us to protect our assets here in Canada, particularly in oil and gas. And there's three very important energy initiatives, uh, in innovation initiatives here, which is COSIA, which has been around for uh, since 2012, uh, CRIN, uh, I think that was probably 2014, something like that. And then most recently, we have uh, Creative Destruction Labs, which I'm a part of, and uh, it's got an energy stream. All of these are all about uh, finding solutions to reduce emissions. And, uh, and increasing the competitiveness uh, for uh, our energy resources. One of the key recommendations that we made for the Federal Economic Strategy Table was to create these technology adoption centers and uh, to really accelerate commercialization of these technologies, which are critical to our industry. But we're at a point where I, I think we actually need now a partner to partner with governments, uh, with federal and provincial, and, and industry to really accelerate this. This is something that I think that we have as an industry actually should be, we should be celebrating globally because it's, we're way ahead of others. So what do you see as a potential of a government really stepping up and partnering with uh, industry to actually uh, uh, accelerate these uh, technologies globally? They turned off your microphone. <laughs> You know, I think this is the sweet spot of what we should be talking about in this room, uh, in this province, uh, and across our country. We, uh, you saw that we put $100 million in the last budget towards CRIN, towards the Clean Resource Innovation Network. That was very specifically about 
thinking about ways that we could actually drive towards uh, solutions that can make a difference. We are going to continue to be focused on how do we advance our economy while driving down our carbon emissions. The carbon intensity, yes, but also the actual emissions. And so to the extent we can work together with, with industry or with other provincial players to actually get at that, that is where we're trying to drive our, our, our resources. So, so we want to create more opportunity for people in Alberta. Uh, we want to create more opportunity for people across the country. And the way we might be able to do that is by co-investing, creating economic advantage for investments in places that are going to be positive for our environment and actually be positive for our long-term future in, in sectors that do emit carbon. And uh, ways that we can actually reduce that over time will help the sustainability of, uh, of, our, of our environment, but also help the ability to get international investors engaged in uh, sectors where they're concerned that that sustainability isn't there. So, so that's where we see our, our ability to work together. Um, we're always going to be thinking about uh, ways that our, our investment federally can co-invest with, with the province, can co-invest with industry to create advantage. And uh, I put it in those investment terms, not in, not in any way trying to just uh, put a bandage over, over problems, but invest towards the future so that we have uh, more optimism and more hope. Minister, thank you for sharing your thoughts. I uh, really appreciate, I think, uh, I hope that we're starting to see a real turning point for our industry here, uh, with TMX starting to move forward uh, with partnerships with Indigenous people, with partnerships with innovation. What, what I'm hoping we'll see is a, a celebration more uh, with the uh, government that actually here in Alberta, we can actually lead in the energy transition. I think you've got people ready and willing, and, uh, and what we hope is that the government will walk with us as we actually lead in the globe. Well, I want to thank you, Lorraine, for being here and doing this this morning. I want to thank all of you for being here this morning. I hope this is... Uh, you know, a good opportunity for us to talk about how we can work together. And I want you to know that we want to remain engaged in creating that long-term opportunity. There will be challenges for sure. We have to recognize our, uh, our climate change objectives, which we all share for, for our generation and for future generations. But we are convinced that we can work together to make a real difference, and I'm looking forward to working together with you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Lorraine, for uh, moderating that uh, robust conversation. Minister Morneau, it's always a pleasure hosting you. Thank you so very much for being here in Calgary and sharing some of the uh, key investment measures that the Government of Canada is taking to really stimulate and uh, strengthen the economies of the West. A big thank you to Parkland and TC for uh, sponsoring today's session. And last but not least, a big thank you to all of you for attending. I hope you have a beautiful day. Cheers. <laughs>